Good morning and welcome. My name is Major Isabella Ramirez. Major Josh Neighbors and I had the honor and privilege to interview Lieutenant Colonel Retired William Shortfinger Schreitfeger. Today he is going to give us his personal perspective from his time as an F-4 pilot and POW in Vietnam. And as you can already see, he's a character and he should be pretty entertaining. We will conduct an onstage interview followed by a short question and answer session. However, here is a short video to highlight his military career. Retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Bill Schwartfeger's military service spanned 20 years. He was born in 1945 in Oklahoma and cultivated a deep passion for flying when he accompanied his uncle on his J-3 Cub flying over his family's farm. He joined the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps at Oklahoma State University and then commissioned in the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant in 1967. Lieutenant Colonel Schwartfiger went on to complete pilot training at Advanced Air Force Base, Oklahoma, and was awarded his pilot wings in September 1968. His first tour in Vietnam was with the 433rd Tactical Fighter Squadron at Uban Royal Thai Air Base, Thailand, from August of 1969 to June 1970. Upon returning to the United States, he attended F-4 pilot upgrade training at George Air Force Base. He then deployed again with the 433rd Tactical Fighter Squadron back to Ubon for his second tour flying over Vietnam. It was during this tour that he was hand-picked as a Wolf Forward Air Controller, a selectively manned squadron of the best fighter pilots from each unit. During his two tours in Vietnam as an F-4 pilot, he accumulated over 1,000 combat hours, spanning 350 and a half combat missions. Then, on 16 February 1972, as the lead Wolf on a combat mission, he was forced to eject over North Vietnam after taking fire from a surface-to-air missile. Lieutenant Colonel Schwartfiger was held captive as a prisoner of war for 407 days until his release during Operation Homecoming on 28 March 1973. Following his recovery, he went on to serve as an F-4 fighter weapons instructor and maintenance liaison officer with the 414th Fighter Weapons Squadron at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. He then served in Europe as an F-4 fighter weapons instructor with the U.S. Air Forces in Europe at the 406th Tactical Fighter Training Wing at Zaragoza Air Base, Spain. Then during the early 1980s, Lieutenant Colonel Schwartfeger transitioned to the F-15 Eagle and was stationed at the 49th Tactical Fighter Wing at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. And just prior to his retirement, he served as the Air Force Advisor to the Kansas Air National Guard at McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas, until he retired on 1 June 1988. During his Air Force career, he logged over 3,500 flying hours in the F-4 and the F-15. After retiring from the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel Schwartfiger went on to fly over 10,000 hours with American Airlines. He currently lives in Kansas with his wife, Fania, taking care of his collection of Corvettes. Ladies and gentlemen. Are we ready? Ladies and gentlemen. Please join us in welcoming to the Gathering of Eagles stage, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Schwartfeger. Hi, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. We're going to go uh, a little bit different in that uh, Alf and Josh are going to do side team me. Uh, so I might be a little jinking, have to use a little bit of chaff and flares to uh, avoid some of the shots they're going to put at me. Go ahead, sir. All right, sir, before we get into uh, your stories of um, in Vietnam, can you tell us a little bit about what influenced you to become a pilot? Well, you know, we saw that J-3, uh, the yellow cub, big balloon tires. Uh, my uncle would always fly out to the farm and deliver the mail or some milk or bread. Uh, and he'd take me flying. And when I was about seven, so this is 1952, uh, he tells me that Oklahoma has his first ace in the Korean War. And I go, 
ace, Korea War. And he says, yeah, it's uh, James Robinson Reisner. And I go, oh, he's a fighter pilot, huh? And I says, I think I want to be like him. Uh, I want to be a fighter pilot. I want to go out there and serve my country. So that's where it all started, that J-3. So those that like little airplanes grow into bigger airplanes, faster airplanes. Uh, that's what it's all about, flying for me. Go ahead, yes. All right. What was it like during your tours in Vietnam? Specifically, we would like to focus on what it was like keeping in touch with your wife and your family before you were shot down. Well, you know, I did two combat tours. I got married in uh, March of 69 at George, and in August, I'm at Dubon. And so it was the standard letter writing, some tapes back with the big cassettes that you would send back in the mail and get a little voice uh, contact. No telephones, no iPads, no links like that that you have nowadays where you can see and talk directly to the fam. And feel like you're really in touch. It was all long distance. The, uh, when I come back to the States to, to upgrade to the front seat, my wife goes, now wait, we've been married uh, for about a year now, and I've been with you for three months. This, what's going on here? And I says, "Hun, this is my passion. This is my desire. It's my calling. I need to upgrade to go back to the war. That was the only way I was going to get in the front seat, or else you go to Europe and sit in a pit for three years. And one year in a pit was about one year too many. The uh, second tour, things were a little bit more heated, and I would take a tape recorder with me during the flight, and if it was a benign oh, hum mission, I would send her that tape back to let her know that it's nothing really uh, to worry about. Everything will be fine. Uh, your daddy is the, the world's greatest fighter pilot. Are we not all the world's greatest? Uh, and I says that uh, everything will be fine. All right, sir, uh, during our interview, uh, during your time in Vietnam, you mentioned that you were shot six times mm. uh, before that seventh shot. And so what gave you the courage to continue suiting up, getting in the jet and flying? Well, I tell you, the Duke, John Wayne, good friend of mine, I talked to him several times during the war, but uh, his philosophy is courage is being scared and saddling up anyway. And that's what our job was. Was I nervous when I went out to the airplane? The very first sortie I flew, my first pit ride at Ubon, I was nervous. But as soon as the gear went up, I knew exactly what we were doing. Uh, the second combat tour, same thing, no fear. Now, a couple of instances where fear jumped out at me was on the first tour. We took a 37 millimeter and wing. That didn't scare me. Snap 270 NKP is on your nose for 95 miles. Diverted, took the wire, the holes like this in the wing, but the mighty F4 brought us home. She's a brute, she's a stallion, she's a stud. That's number one hit. About three or four days later, still in the pit, around Chapone. You know where Chapone's at? 
one of the highest threat areas in Laos with the 3757 and 23s uh, ring that area, a choke point. And I started to suck it up just a little bit that night. A little nervous. And all of a sudden, here comes a string water hose of 23. It's just like taking a red string and pointing it at you. And as long as it's not moving on the canopy, good news. Guess what? It was not moving on the canopy, and we started to move that airplane for all it's worth. Took a 23 and a tail. Hopefully I'm not coming off that mic over there. Snap, 270, NKP's on the nose, 95 miles. But the airplane's flyable. No indications of anything wrong. We talked to AB Triple C, called the command post to Dubon. Do you want us to go to NKP, closest base, or RTB to Ubon? We went back to Ubon. They could fix the tail. And it was a hole about like yay. No big deal. It's not that I'm a lead magnet. I was in the pit, you know, I wasn't even driving a jet. But uh, you find that when you're in combat, hot metal is in the air. And your job is to stay away from the hot metal, okay? Uh, it doesn't do any good to go dueling with somebody. BC Corps, Captain, Wolf Mission, the ZPU comes up. 7.6, and we carried uh, two pods of Willie Peets, white phosphorus rockets, 14 of them total, and center line Su-23 uh, Gatling gun. BC sees this guy open up on us, and it's the old whiffer deal, back around and right in on him. And I'm screaming at him, I says, B.C., we who live by the gun will eventually die from the gun. Kind of scared me. Luckily, that guy died for his opening up on the mighty wolf pack. Took some small arms as we are at low altitude. Checking out targets. You gotta get down to see them. Of course, getting down is 550 with six Gs. The wings are boiling white. Uh, and your job is to get in, over, and out of that threat. Once you got him, you can put some smoke on him, call in some LGBs, laser guided bombs, right guys? And kill. Second tour. Three more hits. All as a wolf. All in the high threat area. We'll save that seventh one for just a little bit later, okay? Uh, the big one. The one where you end up with a half a mission. That's the one that kind of sucks. Is he? Sir, speaking of that half mission, when you took that seventh shot that required you to eject, can you please share with the class what was going through your mind at that time and then what took place once you hit the ground? Yeah. Well, let's kind of lead up to that half mission. 16th of February, 1972. Oh, dark 30 in the morning. The night before, I knew that I was going to be leading eight F-4Ds with laser-guided bombs to the north of the DMZ to take out heavy 130 millimeter gun positions that the North Vietnamese had that were firing on our Arvin and Marine bases to the south of the DMZ. 
And we knew that they were prepping for another tent. And so as I go into the target area, or at the briefing first, uh, Intel says, and I want you Intel folks to listen quite well to this, okay? I want you to listen with all your ear. Cyber guys, perk up. Because the Intel told us that uh, the threat in the area was 37 and 57. I reach into my flight suit pocket, pull out the red flag I always carried with me when I went to a briefing, and it had bullshit on it. And I waved it, and I says, wait a minute. I have pictures of three SAM sites at 5, 15, and 20 clicks north of the DMZ. And the Intel guy goes, where'd you get those? And I says, I got it from my Wolf Intel shop. We spent last night going over film, and we found them. And he goes, oh, no, they're not there. That's old film. So as we go into the target area, just as the sun's coming up, we're down in the weeds trying to pick out these guns right north of the DMZ. Nobody's up, nothing's happening. After spotting six of them, I go to the tank off the beach, the purple tanker, uh, come back, my two uh, F-4 flights out of uh, Uban, 433rd Tactical Fighter Squadron, my squadron guys with uh, eight LGBs. And the job was to kill those heavy artillery pieces. Put down the first mark, boom, 2,000 pounder. No gun, no more. Second smoke, boom, no gun, no more. And all of a sudden, you remember the picture there with the painting of 601, my airplane? It's got 85 millimeter around it. I go, the hell's going on here, man? And I look over here, and it is the classic 85 millimeter gun sight with the fan, fire can radar right here in the middle, and five guns trenched. And the raw radar homing and warning gear in the F-4 says, you got a gun over here. And I go, no shit, I see the flak, okay? And so I tell the guys, we're going to change targets, brief them on the ingress, egress, closest divert base again, and put down a Willie Pete. And I told the guys, and I'm pretty damn good with the Willie Pete. I've been doing this for 350 missions. As soon as I toggled off the, the Willie Pete, I says, hit my smoke. And as I'm cranking, and that was that photo, as I'm cranking, the Willie Pete goes into the van itself. And I says, hit that smoke. <laughs> well, boom. And I says, okay guys, the wind's coming off the beach from the northeast, so we're gonna start at the south end of the gun ring and just work our way into the wind, take out the guns. Eight bombs later, we've got that threat neutralized. First flight of fours out of ordinance. Drop down a stack. Next flight of guys come in and says, okay, we're going back to the guns. Well, as I'm orbiting, waiting for them to get ready, so I can put down a smoke, a 23 just unloads on me, a pair of them. And I look down and there's this giant command center, antennas coming out of one end, and I assume a barracks, because there were little bitty squirrels running around like chipmunks out there, out of the barracks. And I says, okay guys, change target. We're gonna take out this site first so that we can go back to doing our business. So in a curvilinear approach, right? Us fighter pilots know what that is. High G turn, boom, boom, bracket, both ends. This is hit my smokes, 
boom, boom, that command center. And we knocked out about 75 guys uh, out of that hooch. Uh, and about another 30 guys out of the gun pits. He says, okay, let's get back to doing our business. And all of a sudden, the Sam comes up. And you know what that rattlesnake sounds like still? And the strobe's going like this, saying, hey, there's a guy here. <laughs> okay. You know that photo I still had? Let's go find him. Because he's a threat. And I didn't want him uh, or the, my bombers to be exposed to him. So I'm going to go find him. And then maybe we can get some hard bombs in to take out the SAM site. So as I'm going up the river to the north, about 500 feet, 500 to 600 knots, 5 to 6 G's, wings white, I roll over the first SAM site at the five click spot, Star David, classic Star David, empty. Good news, just like the photo, empty. As I come up to the second one, wow, this guy is locked on, the rattle is rattling, and the launch light comes on, followed by two big clouds of dirt coming up. That guy's active. No shit, right? <laughs> now I'm in a defensive turn because these guys are coming right off the rail. Now the only thing I knew, the enemy quite well, is that as long as those boosters were on, those missiles were not a threat to me because they got to drop off for the exposed the guidance antennas to get the information to guide the missile. So they go by close aboard. I mean close aboard, back at us. And I just pop up over the top of that guy and spin. And I call AB Triple C and I says, I've got an active SAM site. I'm over the top of it. He cannot do anything to me. Bring in some guys from Da Nang with rock eye, CBUs, and hard bombs. Well, as I looked at that a little bit more, they had to come up the valley just like I did. That guy could shoot at them, or if they come in from the beach, he could shoot at them. So my intent was to neutralize that SAM site. What does an F4D have on it? No gun this time. The wing commander thought we were using it too much. I had nine Willie Peets left, two AIM 7s, and two tanks. And my intent was to spin, point due east, lock on, put the speed gauge such that it looks at the ground as the target, bore sight, and bore sight two AIM 7s into that SAM site. The expanding rod will do a lot of damage. Once we get some fuel cooking, follow it up with the Willie Peets, really make a hell of a fire. And as I'm going supersonic over the top, just in the tanks, just to see if there's any residual fuel that we can get it to burn. That was the master plan. I know the enemy. Okay, Intel, listen up now. Not only did they not tell us that the Sams were there, but there was a top secret manned by the Russians, SA-2F, the very first optically guided site. And my buddies down at 7th Air Force were in the skiff. Really wasn't a skiff at that time, but you know what I'm talking about. And they were listening to the Russians talk about how they're going to blow 601 and Ralph and I out of the sky. Classified, top secret, secret, no foreign. Did they tell us about it? No. Ralph makes a call. Sam. Well, no shit. I mean, we were, we were just in a battle with one. Uh, the site that was to the north was not launching. The site to the south of me was empty. 
I was very confident. Blows the ass end off the airplane, flat spin, in the chute, land in the rice paddy. Now most of my sorties were flown in Laos, where the path at Lao were not taken prisoners. The response was a machete to the head. And so I always carried four hand grenades with me. Two on the chest belt, two on the gun boat, and leaded hollow points in the pistol. Because if I went down in Laos, there was going to be some hell to pay before I died for my country. As I landed in the rice paddy, right in the crotch of the dikes, there's two squads of regular North Vietnamese coming at me. And the guy here on the left has his nine out, and he's planking right at my feet. So again, I talked to the Duke, and I says, Duke, what do you think? Think we ought to pull a couple of pins, chuck them like this, and go out in a blaze of gory? Or should discretion of valor live to fight another day? And the Duke says, Shortfinger, it's pretty damn simple. Uh, let's live to fight another day. Because I had to untape the pins. My army buddy told me that those, I think they were M9 grenades, the fuses on them are as unreliable as anything else. You might get one that go off in your hand and one not go off. Uh, so we left the grenades alone, immediately captured. You know, Ken will tell you, oh damn. If I had only done this, if I could have got a spot where I could hide for a second, maybe I could have got a 2,000 pounder to make me a foxhole. That's a 30 meter crater. Okay, that's a pretty big foxhole and I could jump in that damn thing and boy, I would have survived and I'd brought out my pistol and I'd been like true grip, you know. Bring them on. But it didn't happen. Ralph, my backseater, obviously goes out first, floats longer, and lands in the village. And there's a villager that's got one of these blunderbuss Plymouth guns. And he points up at Ralph and boo-looey! Misses Ralph. As soon as Ralph hits the ground, though, he turns it around and uses it as a sledgehammer and cold cocks him, knocks him out. Were immediately captured. The guys that were with me were marching me just like this. AK 47s in my back. And the guy stops me right in front of the trench. And he cycles around through the AK. And I look up and I say, God, the Almighty Father. I'm about to die here. Die in a land that nobody will know where and how I died. But I pray that you have mercy upon my soul. The guy then turned me to parallel that trench. And I turned around and told the Lord, I says, thank you, Lord, for saving me. For I knew that I would survive. Where are we at, Josh? Sir, so it took about two days um, from where you crashed to you got to Hanoi. Yes. And so tell us a little bit about that process uh, when you were separated into, uh, into different interrogation rooms uh, from Ralph, yes. uh, your navigator. And can you describe that initial intake at the Hanoi Hilton? Well, Ken knows what that ride's like. Uh, some guys had to walk it. Uh, some of us were lucky enough to uh, Jeep transport. But when we pulled up in front of the green door, and I'd never ever seen that green door, and I told Ralph, we're at the Hilton, man. We're here. 
Uh, and they put us, separated us, and put us in a separate uh, quiz rooms, and asking all kinds of questions. And, and I riot up, I told Ralph, this is our story, and we're going to stick with it. And the story was, this was our very first mission. We weren't even supposed to be in that area, but I got lost. And, oh my God, we ended up getting shot down. Very simple. Can't screw that one up. Ralph says, good plan. And so we stuck with that for this initial quiz section. And he goes, nah, I don't believe that. I said, sorry, sir, that's all I know. Uh, you know, the started out with the initial name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. But I had a felt like I had to give them something, and so I gave them the most simple thing that we could do of why I was now a prisoner of war. That worked for 90 days. Worked for 90 days, solitary confinement. As a new guy, the longest guy in uh, solitary. Quizzes, as Ken knows, is on and off, day in, day out, all night, day. And there was this little lieutenant with a vein right here. And if he didn't get the answer that he wanted, it would pop out. Now the thing was, this is 1972, not 1966. And so, basically, hands off. I knew he just wanted to reach across the table and choke the crap out of me. And he was asking me about laser-guided bombs. And I go, I don't know anything about laser-guided bombs. And they break out Aviation Week and says, here's the laser guided bomb. Tell me about it. I said, I don't know anything. Then he lays a sheet of paper on the table. And it's a copy of my Form 5. And it has the fact that I've flown 350 missions, got over 1,000 hours of combat, boat tours in the 433rd Tactical Fire Squadron, which is a laser guided bomb squadron. Oh, that new guy out here just rooting around uh, ain't going to cut it anymore. I said, I still don't know anything about the LGBs. Now, the odd thing was, at the back of the quiz room were blue epilepsies and Caucasians. My guess, Russians. They wanted to know what the hell's going on here. I still played the village at it and said, I don't know anything about laser guided bomb. And he wasn't touching me, so therefore I wasn't going to give him squat. On the 10th of May, an infamous day for the 433rd Tactical Fighter Squadron, when D.L. Smith took eight F-4Ds to Hanoi and dropped the Doomer Bridge with laser-guided bombs. That night, long clothes Drag me out of the camp. Oop, ain't supposed to do that. Right, Ken? We can't leave the camp. That was our plums. Okay, where are we going? Go to another camp. Walk in, and there's the bug and straps and bars. The bug's a little interrogator, about this tall, pith helmet, dark glasses. Straps and bars is about as tall as I am. And the other guy is about 5'9". Uh, the bug's sitting at a table. And I'm six foot plus. They throw me down on the floor, and bug, now looking down upon me, says, tell me about the LGB. I say, I don't know squat about LGBs. What do you mean? They grab me up and straps and bars right here, takes the AK-47 he had, and he bangs me right here, and over here on the wall, which is rugged rock, jagged brick rock, to about the shoulder height plus, bangs me into that thing. Necessarily, I go down to the ground. 
They drag me back up. Tell me about LGB. Don't know shit. Back down on the ground, the straps and bars goes over to the corner, corner and starts to break out the ropes. And in Ken's case, they were manacled and roped between their biceps to get, make her elbows touch, and then up and over the top of their shoulders to their ankles. Very painful, right, Ken? Cuts off the blood supply, shoulders, gut, diaphragm, the whole nine yards. Mine was a little bit different because what they did was, ouch, I was flex cuffed like this and then took the ropes between my biceps and made the elbows touch. Okay, anybody want to put them there? I mean, I realize that I'm a little bit older, a little bit rounder, but they don't go there. But they will, right, Ken? Damn square they'll go there. And then up and over the top, and what you do is rotate out, rotate over the top, dislocate shoulders. Very painful. When the bug asked me again, LGBs, I go, I still don't know anything. Straps and bars, walks over, and picks up a fan belt. And I knew that at that instant, if I lost control of this through pain, I'd be toast. I would say things that I would not normally want to say. So I tell the bug as I'm like this, verily breathing, maybe I know something. He goes, well tell me about the LGB. I says, I can't because I can hardly breathe. The pain is so extreme. I need to be out of this position. When they took the ropes off and the blood started to flow back in, right, Ken? Painful as going in. Maybe, in fact, more painful. I spent another 10 days in solitary confinement and heartbreak. Great place to be. Uh, quizzing almost 24-7 about LGBs. And the thing that got me and my attention was when I told the bug, maybe I know something about LGBs, in my mind's eye, I could see the bug go, yet another Yankee airport fall. In my heart of my heart, I was looking up to the bug and saying, Bug, I have won because I'm going to shovel so much crap up your backside. Because you don't know anything about the LGBs. So I can say anything about nothing. You did it times three, multiply it times ten. Something that the bomb can't do. It was very effective. They thought they were getting something, and they were getting squat. That's number seven in the day in the jailhouse, 16 or 10 May. Is he? Thank you for taking the time to, to share that part of um, your time there at Hanoi. Kind of transitioning towards the end, and, and you knew that you were going to be released. Um, can you share a little bit with the class what that felt like? How did you know? Um, and at what point did you really recognize that you were, you were coming home? Okay. Now, Ken and the guys know for sure. They've been jerked around so many times. That, oh, you're going to be released. Only to find out that <laughs> that was a joke. But on the 27th of January, 1973, Kissinger signed the peace accords in Paris. And as soon as that happened, things changed. You were still up at the dog patch, I think, or up north, Cowbang. Were you at the Hilton? Okay. It was the first time that 
we got out of the cells as a group. We could talk through the bamboo to the old guys. I actually got some face on face time. And our job as new guys in room five while in captivity was to provide as much information. We had a guy that worked at Boeing on the Saturn V. We told him about the launch in, in uh, 69 to the moon. We told him about, oop, hair is now long, skirts are now short, and things have really changed a lot. So we tried to prep them as best we could through messaging and talking direct about get them ready to come home. They also fatten us up. I don't know about Ken, but I went in at 185, come out at 150, and I was probably down to about 130 prior to the getting fattened back up. Uh, a lot of soybean cake, a lot of salmon stuff. First time we got medical attention, as crude as it was, but we got some medical attention. Ken had boils out the wazoo. We had a guy in our room that probably had over about 100 on his body, and we called him Mr. Puss Man because it was just, he was just a solid bore. Uh, we used toothpaste to, to help medicate his spots. But the deal was is that we knew we were coming home. They moved us, the new guys, the FNGs, from the Hilton back over to the zoo, getting the sequence ready to come out. The first guys come out on President's Day, February the 12th, 1973. Four March, 28 March is when I come out, and the last flight was on the 29th of March. And when we finally got on the bus with our little clothes bag, we knew it was probably true. Couldn't guarantee it, but we knew it was probably closer than what it had been before. And we stopped short of the staging area, and it looked like the moon around us. I mean, my buddies in the F of the B-52s lit up and wiped out the rail yard, the area around the airfield. It just looked like the moon. And I tell you what, we were silently, shit hot, shit hot. Then we transitioned from control from North Vietnamese to the general that was there to greet us. And as we were walking, out. My escort asked me, he said, sir, would you ever want to come back here? I says, I'll fly one mission with a B-61 and I'll give Laos some beach time because we're going to move Haiphong and everything towards Laos. He kind of chuckled. The greatest day when you saw that picture of us all on the airplane, that's our flight. That's the 28 March flight. If you go to President Nixon's library, your Belinda, it covers an entire wall about the size of this, and it's our pictures. Bill Talley is the guy in the middle with the, the big smile and his mouth wide open and his hands, and I'm just at his right five o'clock with the same big smile. When we got out of that airplane, we were military disciplined. We marched, set, and waited. And only when the aircraft commander says, you are now feet wet out of North Vietnamese airspace, did we erupt into the screams and joys of freedom. And Ken knows what freedom's about and being denied freedom. It's for you to ensure we maintain that freedom and that we'll never leave anybody behind. 
will bring them home. Yes? Josh. Yes, sir, we're about almost 15 minutes okay. left. So I encourage everybody to really read these interviews because um, there's a lot more to this story. Um, but we do want to give the, our class here an opportunity to ask some questions. So please, at this time, feel free to ask some questions. Um, and if, if y'all don't have any, we have more questions. If you don't talk, I guarantee you I will. So let's, let's open up a little bit. I know Adams here from Oklahoma State, and he's, I've been with him for four years. So he's heard my story for four years straight. Dan Hughes is here from Vance. And he's heard my story about three times. But there's, if there's a question, great. If not, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about uh, the war. Go ahead, sir. Sir, we have a Cadet Fiorino here at the wall uh, with a question for you. Okay. You can move to the mic and. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us. You're welcome. Um, I was reading through your interviews in the book and I noticed defiance came up multiple times yes and it was integral to your mindset as a pow and even after you came back yes and i was hoping you could just elaborate on that for us okay defiance i give you some examples of defiance i'll use Admiral Stockdale, the CAG. He had been beaten and tortured to make a press conference to sign some document. When the pain got to such that he says, yes, I'll go, they threw him back in the cell, let him get his bearings back. And when he went back to the cell, he had a stool and he started beating his face with the stool. He was bloody in his face. And when he thought that wasn't enough, he started beating his face against the cement walls in the cell. And when the guards came in to drag him out for this interview, they 180'd out. He was defiant. He was outside of the box and denied the enemy to propagandize himself and his values. On another in instance, the CAG, again beaten and tortured for another conference, thrown back to the cell. And in the corner of his cell, he had an old rusty razor blade. And the keg went like this and cut his wrist. And his statement was, I would rather die than submit to the enemy. The keg, Medal of Honor. Other instances were prominent throughout the case. And the senior leadership, the SROs, really defined the word defiance. Don't give in. Be strong. Have faith in your fellow prisoner of war. Have faith in your country. And have faith in God. And with that, you will have the strength to survive. Defiance is critical. Never give up. For if you lose this, you're dead. The body will survive all the pain and the agony and the starvation and the torture. But you gotta have this. And that's what we're paying you for. To be the smartest, brightest future leaders of our great nation. You had a question. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your family's experiences uh, having you missed that long and then also the integration once you did get 
Okay, uh, kind of short and sweet. Uh, my wife got a call from uh, Senator Kennedy. Ugh. I don't like that thought. But it says, watch television tonight. And that was my shoot down. And then, release, she was watching us when we got off the airplane at Clark. And the tears, the tears across the nation were paramount, flowing. And 591 guys brought the nation together. The first time in the Vietnam War that the people of our great nation were in sync with Operation Homecoming. My integration back into the world was simple. 13 months, hell, that's just a small TDY someplace, okay? I can handle that. Six years. Ev Alvarez, eight and a half years. Robbie Reisner, seven and a half years. Four years in solitary confinement in a cell blacked out. Four steps by three steps by four steps. No light. How do you survive in that environment? Faith in your fellow prisoner of war. The ability to communicate. Leadership among your fellow prisoners. And again, faith in God will get you through. Any other questions? Sir, we have another one here at the mic. Okay. Go ahead. Can't hear you. So you mentioned communicating with your, fesnal, your fellow yes. prisoners of war. Uh, could you speak to those communication tactics, how you kept in touch with the other POWs in the camp? Well, uh, yeah. I remember the first time I tried to tap code to the, the guys at the zoo. And I'm using the quadratic five by five, drop out to K, so it's pretty simple. Call them in row, and I go find R in my mind, and tap R, and then I find 45 for U, tap U, and then find O and C for K. Are you okay? And what I get back, I mean, these guys have been tapping for seven years, okay? <laughs> we were texting in 1965. <laughs> they were professionals. They could do 100 words a minute. And I'm back here in square one of... So it took me a while. When we had line of sight, this communication was quite easy. Cut out to having to go from numbers to letters or letters to numbers to your finger making the tap. Other communications were critical. Our Thai counterparts, our Laotian counterparts, our South Vietnamese counterpart, and Hagdol, Seaman Hagdol, were free in the camp as they swept. And they would sweep the tap code. Sweep the tap code. When the stuff came out of China from the north in the, in the winter, everybody was snotting and spitting and coughing and you could <coughs> sneeze the tap code. Communicate. Communication is critical. Anything else? Sir, I do have, I have one, one whoa, we got some, someone going to the mic. Okay. How are we doing on time? Uh, this will be our last question, sir. Okay. You got the last one, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, Major Smith from Flight 8. 
Uh, just to jump ahead a bit, we've talked a lot in this class about the need for modernization. Oh, yeah. As someone who experienced firsthand the post-Vietnam modernization, going from the F-4 to the F-15, mm. and uh, establishment of the weapons school and things like that, do you think we did it right then, and do you think that the Air Force and the DOD is still doing it right today? Thank you, sir. Damn right. Damn right. You know, at the close of the Vietnam War, Red flag was brought up of speed, where guys were taught combat for the first 10 missions so that they could survive the threat. They didn't want guys like Mike Lane to be shot down on his first mission. So it was a prep program. We brought on the Gomers. That's the T-38s at the time, then the F-5s, and now the F-16s and the Eagles. Eagles are no longer there as gomers. But real air-to-air -air threats, the ground threats grew from almost nothing to a massive array out on that Nellis range. To have spent six years as an instructor at Nellis in the weapons school, I can guarantee you we did it right. Now we have weapons school programs for all systems so that you can integrate your system with everybody else's system so you know the big picture. For one of these days, you're going to be like General Holland or General Silton. Commanders in the field. Information is critical. Communications is critical. And it's up to you to solve those problems today as our future leaders. Don't sit back on your haunches. Get up on your toes and press forward. Innovate. And please, God, for anything else, think outside of the box. Get out of the box and think and solve problems. Where are we at? Is that enough? Yes, sir. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Schwertfeger, we want to thank you for being with us today and for sharing your experiences and your leadership insights and your story. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.